Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Markets with Sean Hackett. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Axon Tire, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. For more information, go to axontire.com. Axon Tire would like to give the loyal listeners of the Moving Iron Podcast a free Alliance Tire resource mouse pad. If you're interested in getting one of those, go to axontiretips.com, fill out their form, read some of those articles, and they'll send you one in the mail. Send you two in the mail, actually. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. And no matter how you buy your ag equipment, whether it's from a dealer, an auction, or a private party, Ag Direct can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. TractorZoom has access to over $20 billion worth of heavy Machinery sells data. Tractor Zoom's Iron Comp is the industry's trusted solution for transparent heavy equipment values and auctionable pricing insights. Sean Hackett is with Boca Raton. Not, you're not with Boca Raton, Florida. You're with Hackett Financial out of Boca Raton, Florida. I am Boca Raton, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Sean is uh, nice enough to come on a couple times a week, sit down and talk about what's going on. He's fresh off vacation, so the guy's got, got more. Uh, he's been on a sailboat for 10 days, so he's been like, Chasing his friend Wilson around and all that kind of stuff. I've been swimming in salt water for so so many days. I think I my high blood my blood pressure must be off the charts because of all that salt that I absorbed in the body. System. Yeah. I feel good, but I'm yeah. pumped up, man. Pumped. Yeah, ready to go. So <laughs> hasn't had a, he hasn't talked to anybody for ten days. So he's going to let it all come out here. So it's going to be it's going to be good. I'm looking forward to it. Sean, how you been, buddy? Good, real good, really really good. Well, while you were on vacation. Um, couple of things happened. One is you talked about this, this extreme heat that we were going to see uh, in July. And I think as July went on, the, the heat got more extreme as, as July went on. And we hit our, we hit our high out here of 108 degrees on Monday. And, you know, it's been 99 to hundred on both sides of that pretty much a week. But if you take a look, one thing you did talk about though, is that there's going to be a significant cooling that happened and there'd be some more uh, precipitation that we would see in the forecast going into late July going into August. And if you take a look at your forecast right now, the 10 day forecast, you're starting to kind of see that start to develop, I guess. So with all that going on and then what we see happening here in the marketplace, we're just adding some fuel to the, uh, the bearish uh, mentality of the market right now. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, we had thought there was a shot at a weather scare rally in July from a lot of heat and, and in Europe as well, which has also been very hot. Um, They've been drier over there. Um, we've had that pattern, but unfortunately it occurred at a time that we had an extremely aggressive liquidation event in overall commodities. I mean, speculators selling everything, energy, metals, selling everything. If you're going to override a strong dollar, rising interest rates, liquidity erosion, flight to safety, all these things that have been going on in the bearish macro picture, you need a weather scare that is you know, high order. Um, and we just didn't quite get it um you know even with the heat that came in we've had some you know just enough rain and just enough places and now the forecasts you know are turning cooler and wetter as we get to the end of the month and into early august and and so so the so the market is saying yeah we get it the crops aren't going to be the best ever but it looks like they're going to be good enough and in this environment where there's a lot of bearish you know forces out there you know we're we're just not going to, we just don't think this is enough of an event to, to turn the bearish tide heading into early harvest. And so I think our view has been that, you know, we're going to see this um, early harvest low in August. And um, you know, right now it looks to us like maybe mid August could be that, um, you know, that period. And so we'd be looking for some kind of a bottoming pattern. I want to be very clear. I think most of the downsides behind us, Casey, you know, I mean, maybe we're talking about mid fives on corn. Maybe we're talking about mid twelves on soybeans. Maybe we're talking about mid sevens on on wheat. But when you're looking at where prices already are, compared to where they were, you know, we're, we're only talking about you know a, a relatively small decline from here relative to what we've already done. So I'm I'm thinking bottoming pattern, establishing some kind of a back and forth pattern here, and then um and then we can look for some kind of a now. I want to be clear. This is not a, we don't think this is a major low, a major low. We define as a low that will stand 12 months or longer. We yeah. think this is an intermediate low, a low that will stand for six months. So we think that the low that's coming here in August 
will last into the end of the year, but we don't think this is a major low. The major low is going to come next summer when we fully price in the El Nino and the good weather pattern that's going to bring. That will be a, a major low where we think, you know, 12 months or longer bottom. We think this is a good intermediate low, which means if you're a livestock producer, um, you know, this would be a time to make sure you get your cells uh, tidied up for the next six months or so. Um, you know, if, uh, and so that, that's where we think we're at. And now the question is exactly when do we bottom and how low? And obviously we'll be looking in the weeks ahead with our smart money algorithm, a lot of our technicals and just try to figure out, you know, wh where that focal point will kind of put in that intermediate low. So. Okay. Um, as you look at the, I mean, as we sit here right now, we're looking at the overall prices that we see. Do you think we're, we're headed under five? Do you think we're headed mid five? I mean, kind of what's your guess there when you're, when you're looking because at I don't think these crops are going to be bin buster crops. I mean, I think they're going to be good, but not great. What does good, but not great mean? It means slightly below trend, slightly below trend means we'll get, we'll increase our ending stocks a little bit, but not to the, we're not going to just put the, put the ending stocks back in that we had two years ago and say that we're done. We got plenty of, you know, we're going to put a little on, we're going to put a little back but it's not going to be enough to, to it's not going to be enough for the market to say we, we, we can let our guard down. And so they're going to have to worry about the South American crop. Right. Um, and even though I believe El Nino, we're talking about El Nino coming, Casey, yeah. we still have this, we're going to still have some La Nina uh, reverberations. Cause remember we talked about this, is a transition phase. It just, it's just not like it stops. We're still going to have some La Nina ish uh, reverberations in the fall. And there'll be enough to worry about, at least for a little while to create this short-term intermediate term low and maybe post-harvest rally into the fourth quarter. And then once the, this El Nino weather pattern kicks in down there and the market goes, Oh my gosh, they're going to have a big crop in South America. We put in that top and then we, then we roll over again. So I, I think, you know uh, I don't think we're looking at below five corn. I think it's more in the mid five ish. I, I just don't think we're in a spot that the fundamentals would support um, you know, prices below five this time around unless we just have a, com a complete meltdown and everything you know and maybe right. we will you know i i don't know how to forecast that i know mm -hmm. you know we've had a lot of selling pressure and things but but you know i don't know how to predict a, a COVID event or a 2008 right. nine financial crisis i know when we may be at risk of one but to, is it actually gonna I, I don't know it would have to be something like that casey that takes us under five in my opinion if without that i think mid fives holds this corn market yeah, so. if, if you knew that, you'd be on your, we'd be doing this from your <laughs> sailboat. So I've been, yeah. I've been doing it for my sailboat, that's for sure. <laughs> right on. Uh, okay, so you, Ukraine, right? So we, last time we talked about Ukraine, you know, you brought up a good point that Ukraine doesn't matter anymore. I mean, it matters, but it doesn't matter because, I mean, we don't hear about it on the news like we did, you know, back in February and March. It was just like nonstop, nonstop, nonstop. Trying to make its way back in with this, whole Russia, Turkey, Ukraine, let's get together and figure out how we can make this work thing. And we're going to get it all put together. And, and, uh, you know, Russia's trying to, trying to play the, the good bad guy here. And, and it's not really working well for him because they're not agreeing to anything. Right. So it's just, uh, one useless talk after another, almost similar to the, to the, to the Chinese, um, U S, uh, you know, export, talks that we would import export talks that we talk, you know, trade talks and stuff like that kind of going nowhere. Um, and then all of a sudden it'll happen and nothing really takes place. So I guess looking at that, what, what effect of tomorrow? I mean, obviously a lot of things have to fall in place before you can get a ship out of the, out of that area anyway, but tomorrow um, Russia says, you know what, we're going to, we're going to open this lane up and we're going to let everybody come in and out of this lane to get grain out of Ukraine and we're going to call it, we're all going to be friends there. We're going to keep the, the world fed. What, what's the immediate effect you see on the marketplace? Well, I mean, I think you know, one of the reasons why wheat markets come down so much is the, the view that, you know, this um, idea that Ukraine would be completely cut off forever right. um, is not, you know, it, it's becoming less likely that something will come out of there. Now it may not be a lot, but something will come out of there. And when you were pricing in nothing, forever and you get something, you know, that's a huge psychological shift in the market psychology. Um, I don't really know what to make of it. I don't know what, what you know, is, is Russia. I just, I keep trying to wonder what, you know, what's in it for Russia to do this. 
that had in order for Russia to really start to make friends again, they'd have to let enough grain go through that it actually would make a difference. Like right. if they let a couple of yeah. cargoes through, who cares? I mean, they, exactly. they need to, yeah. you know, but if they let, if they let Ukraine sell half, that would be significant. You know, right. I just, I don't think maybe, yeah, I, I don't know. I just don't think that that's what is going to happen here. I think there's something, I think this is part of a chess piece play on the, on, on the chessboard that is going to lead to something else that we're not aware of right now, but I just, I, I think I view this as a car salesman, you know, trying to sell you a car that, you know, won't, won't last for two weeks. And he's telling you it's perfectly good. I just right. think there's, it's a very fishy situation and I don't trust it. So. Yeah. But well, no, that's just, I mean, last thing Russia is going to do. I mean, why, why would they let a bunch of, of grain leave that that's going to help fund their enemy that they're fighting against with, with more cash and capital to keep fighting. It just doesn't make any sense. My, my bigger picture I do with wheat is that the, the, that Russia itself has its own wheat and a lot of it, right? They're harvesting it. Now it's a big crop. They had a lot from last year. They're going to take a bunch and sell it. So the market needs to absorb that supply in the market. Um, I think they're going to be aggressive sellers. They're starting to be. In fact, if you look at their exports week over week, month over month and year over year, they're really picking up the exports. We have to absorb that. The wheat market will bottom when that reaches its peak, and those exports be either level off or back off. Um, that I feel very comfortable in being able to predict. I can't predict what Ukraine's going to buy, but I think ultimately that's not going to be what it seems to be right now, as we just said. So, so that leads me into the, 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 the idea that the market's going to price in these big exports out of Russia, the buyers who have been wanting to buy large quantities of wheat for over the last six months are going to get an opportunity to buy big quantities, obviously at a big discount. And I think they'll buy those huge exports at a big discount. And once you clear that early harvest pressure, you clear that, you know, selling off the combine pressure from Russia, then I think the wheat market can head back up. And I also think that's when this um, Ukraine thing starts to get murky again, where we realize that it's actually not what we thought. So, you know, that's to me is where, you know, follow Russia's exports. I think that will be the key to the, when the wheat market bottoms here in August and when it starts to turn up, um, you know, and, and on, on a kind of a typical post-harvest rally kind of a thing. That to me is more of a, of a solid way of looking at the wheat market than trying to figure out every day sound bite, what's going to happen, what does it mean? You know, that's pretty tough. You know, you, we've seen the market rally and then fall and all these news. It's kind of like the trade war after a while. You say, you know what? Until the Chinese start buying, I'm not buying it. And then when they started buying, then you bought it. <laughs> right. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> you know, but it took, but yeah. it took two years to get yeah. to that point. In the meantime, yeah. it was just all, all for nothing, right? Yep. So That's exactly right. All right. Natural gas. With the pressure that we see in, in Europe right now with the extreme heat, and, and the demand they have for natural gas to, you know, make electricity so they can do what they do um, when it comes to running air conditioners and all these different things with, with where we're at now. And then you couple, um, you know, Russia saying like, yeah, we'll just cut, we're going to cut off Germany and we're going to cut off uh, Eastern Europe with, uh, or the West anyway, the Western Europe off with, uh, with all their fuels and stuff that come to them. What, what's your thoughts with natural gas? And where do you think that's going? Well, look, uh, Europe has enough natural gas to get through into the winter, and they have enough. So there's not no there's no energy crisis until you get to the winter. Unfortunately, you know, for whatever reason, we had this explosion at the Freeport ex Export Terminal mm -hmm. in the U.S. that sells 25 percent LNG. All that was supposed to go to Europe. They're not getting it. Uh, they're supposed to start selling LNG from there starting in September and they think they'll be back up to normal exports by December. But in the meantime, Europe has missed out on probably three months of exports out of that one terminal. Now they're beginning exports from the other terminal, but you know, they're going to have the, the, the real energy crisis. Well, look for two years, Casey, you know, they have had, well, they've had $40 plus natural gas right. when Russia was still, giving them some natural gas. Okay. Yeah. If, if, if we get to the weather and they actually don't give them any natural gas, if that's actually what happens, you know, we can't ship them enough. There's, there's, we, we don't have the capacity to ship them enough. Right. 
Um, you know, in, unless we have summer a summer a summer in the winter time in Europe, which probably not. You know that that's where your weather that's where your energy crisis really play, takes place. I mean, that's where they could run out of their supplies. I mean, they they have not run out in the last two years, and we had forty dollar plus natural gas prices. They you know they got close to running out, right. but they would run out. They would absolutely one hundred percent run out. So either they're going to run out or the politicians are going to do a sleight of hand like a magician. You know, you see it, you see it, see it. And they're going to cut some last minute deal to make sure that does not happen. Because I just can't imagine that the politicians wouldn't be taken out on a stretcher um, if they run out of energy and your economy goes into the dark ages Mm. and people are, you know, freezing to death. I, I just don't think that's in the politicians best interest. I think they'll find a way to not let that happen. I, you know, th- they may be a lot of things, politicians may be a lot of things, but I do know they absolutely positively want to stay in office and they will not stay in office if they run out of natural gas. So it's a complicated uh, chess board match that's going on. And there's a lot of uh, talk, but, but right now Europe knows they're not going to run on natural gas between now and November. So they can play this game and can play this hardball, and, but you know, they're going to have to start giving in and start making some concessions. I think, or else they're just going to commit suicide for themselves. Um, and, and then it gets to be you know, a historically ugly situation of, of the highest order if they actually don't have enough natural gas to keep their industries going, not to mention to keep their people from freezing to death. Yeah. So. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. All right. We have talked about this 2022 going into 23, how this, this winter coming early thing, right? And – old wives tell here my grandma used to tell me this all the time when you hear the locust or cicadas depending on where you're at uh start start uh singing out there at night you've got six weeks before the first frost well i heard i heard them the other night so that, would, that means that the first frost is coming here sometime the first week of september you heard it on casey's show first <laughs> yeah a locust told me all right so it's uh uh i guess you know looking at that sean and, and you've talked about it quite a bit what are your thoughts right now going into the fall here? And, and, and what is, what's your weather patterns looking like? Are they still falling what you um, have been talking about over the last couple of years? I mean, they, they really have. I mean, our idea is that La Nina would last into the spring and begin to weaken, which of course it has significantly weakened. Um, the weather forecasters keep pumping up the idea. This is a historic La Nina because that it's good for business, right? It's good for mm-hmm. eyeballs, people. But we, we actually have not been in the La Nina. If you just look at the central sea surface temperatures of the Pacific, in order to actually be in, in the La Nina, by that definition, you have to be you have to have sea surface temperatures at minus 0.5 degrees C or less. We've been at minus three and minus 0.2 for about 30 days now. So the, from that from that construct, we've not been in La Nina for 30 days. Now there's other there's other variables that still say we're in sort of a linea. I told you it's a transition, right? It's not yep. just, but, but it's been weakening significantly. And we keep, I keep hearing this nonsense about, oh, this is a record long La Nina. We've never seen this before. It hasn't, it's not. The average La Nina that occurs after the trough of an 11 year solar cycle is two years. The two year point, if La Nina were to continue into the fall, that would be two years. That's a perfectly normal La Nina, nothing unusual. Right. We've had La Nina's last three years in the past. So, so it's just, I, I feel that many of the weathermen and the forecasters, and the I'm not saying they're not really good, honest people and have wonderful families and doing some good stuff, but they're just hopelessly trying to hang on to La Nina because it's, it's, it promotes this idea of, you know, weather volatility and extremes. We're all right. going to die and burn to death. And, and I just think they're sending the wrong message about what's really going on, what the actual data is telling us, what the actual data is telling us is La Nina's weakening significantly. And no, it's not record strong. And no, it's not record long. And when you look at something like the Southern Oscillation Index, which is a measure of the pressure differential um, of Western, the Western Pacific to the Eastern Pacific, which determines the trade winds, when you're in a positive structure, uh, that's a sign that La Nina will continue. Meaning when you have positive differentials. Um, when you have negative differentials, that means the winds shift. And that means that you're moving into a um, El Nino structure. Well, the Southern Oscillation Index has been in a 30-day downtrend. In fact, we're now been in in, in negative territory for the last three or four days, which is a El Nino signature. 
Well, that means that, you know, that that is a sign that it, that 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 leads more weakening in La Nina later on in the summer into the fall. So these are all this is anyone can look at this information, Casey. I'm not it's not like I'm just trying to, you know, make something up. This is the actual data that comes out every single day that anybody can go monitor for free if they want to. And it's, it's painting a very different picture from what is being promoted out there in the majority of the weather community. And I think they're doing a tremendous disservice to farmers, to industries who are relying on these people to give them, to give them it straight. I think they're, they're just not doing it. They're, they're doing a disservice to their customers and to the world at large. That's how I feel about it. So, yep. okay. Well, good stuff as usual, Sean. I don't want to work you too hard coming back from vacation. <laughs> got to get your legs back underneath you. So, <laughs> If people want to reach out to you, get more information about what you're doing over at Hackett Financial, what's the best way to do that? Our website is Hackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, advisors.com. As you know, Casey, we have um, some podcasts and sure. videos and white papers and sample reports. In fact, we have a fresh new series of um, interviews with Real Vision that we just did a few weeks ago that goes over you know, our overall view in a little more detail about this El Nino that's coming for 23 and then the Gleisberg mm -hmm. cycle that's coming for 24 that we've talked about in your show yep. and that we'll be talking about at your summit here in September. Um, really, really big, big, big changes coming up on um, the next three years are going to, you know, if anyone thinks this weather volatility cycle is going to calm down, they're going to be proven uh, wrong. In fact, it's going to fire up even more. Um, first, it's going to be bearish. Right. And then it's going to be a wild bullish scenario. So you as a producer, you as an end user, anyone involved in the ag trade needs to be able to position correctly for the bearish and then the, and then the bullish whipsaw that we're going to be seeing based upon this weather volatility that our natural climate cycle algorithm is forecasting very clearly here. So. Right on. Okay. Well, I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Make sure you check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's where you find the latest editions of the Moving Iron Podcast. Also go to LinkedIn at Moving Iron, uh, Moving Iron Podcast, and then go to the YouTube channel where you can see the video version of this. That's at the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. So check that out. You can also go to movingironllc.com for everything Moving Iron related, blog posts, the entire library of Moving Iron Podcast. And you get all the information for the Moving Iron Summit coming up here in Nashville, Tennessee, September 6th, 7th, and 8th. If you're interested in coming to that, you can send me an email at Moving Iron Podcast, Moving Iron Podcast.com, and I can answer any questions you got, or you can just go right there and fill out the form and get yourself registered. So, good friend Alex Chenko is still over in Ukraine doing the Lord's work over there. If you're interested in helping Alex out, go to the show notes. There's a, a link to his GoFundMe page. So, check that out. Any help you want to throw his way would be greatly appreciated. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour with Sean Hackett. Let's go with some iron folks. Out. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron, time and 